I'm Mark Golub, and in the news is a dramatic statement issued by the Arab League at their recent meeting in Cairo. The Arab League statement reads, The Council of the Arab League confirms its support for the Palestinian leadership in its effort to end the Israeli occupation over Palestinian land and emphasizes its rejection of recognizing Israel as a, quote, Jewish state, unquote. The Arab League chief, Nabil El-Arabi, also confirmed that the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, will never recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And El-Arabi also articulated the essence of why it's so important that in a peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, the Palestinians do, formally, do not formally recognize Israel as a Jewish state. It has to do with a Palestinian right of return. Obviously, any significant Palestinian influx into Israel would threaten the Jewish character of Israel, which is why El Arabi stated, Palestinians fear the demand for recognition of Israel as a Jewish state is an attempt to restrict possible return options for Palestinian refugees. Now, we should remember what Secretary of State John Kerry stated at AIPAC earlier this month, that any peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians will include mutual recognition of a Jewish state and a Palestinian state, and that a resolution of Palestinian return cannot threaten the Jewish character of Israel. Here's Secretary of State Kerry at AIPAC. What the end game should look like is straightforward. Security arrangements that leave Israelis more secure, not less. Mutual recognition of the nation state of the Jewish people and the nation state of the Palestinian people. An end to the conflict and to all claims. A just and agreed solution for Palestinian refugees. One that does not diminish the Jewish character of the state of Israel. Well, if on the one hand, the Kerry Peace Initiative is grounded in Palestinian recognition of a Jewish state of Israel, and on the other hand, Mahmoud Abbas takes the position that he will never recognize Israel as a Jewish state, and the Council of the Arab League supports Abbas's rejection of Israel as a Jewish state, is this not a death knell for the current peace process? Well, for some insight on the subject, we're joined on our phones right now by a gentleman who's been a passionate supporter of the peace process and the two-state solution, and a man who has defended the good intentions of Mahmoud Abbas in the peace process. And again, you've seen him often on Shalom TV, a wonderful individual, Ken Bob, president of Amenu, the Progressive American Labor Zionist Organization. And Ken, thank you so much for joining us once again. Good to be here. Thanks for having me again. Ken, what's your reaction to Mahmoud Abbas saying he will never acknowledge Israel as the Jewish state and the Arab League's full endorsement of that rejection? I think we're in a situation now where there are a number of issues that are related. In your introduction, you mentioned that the, re the reason uh, behind this rejection of Israel as a Jewish state is linked to the issue of right of return. Uh, my feeling is that um, if and when these peace talks do get to the, the final stages and there's a need for trade-offs between the parties, I think that a language can be accepted which um, acknowledges the Jews' narrative, if you will, of Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people without the distinction of a Jewish state. I think the other factor here we have to remember is that 20 percent of Israel today um, is inhabited by non-Jewish citizens, so that I think it, at the beginning now when no issues have actually been finalized yet for the Palestinians to give on this issue is actually um, not realistic, uh, but I think that we will get there in the end. And I think in the end, when um, if we get to a peace agreement and it's the end of claims and the end of conflict, there will be some acknowledgment of Israel as the homeland for the Jewish people, and there can be a, a minority population there as well. I want to make sure we understand what you're saying. You point out, of course, it's a very important distinction that everyone should understand and I think most people do, that Israel does have a significant non-Jewish population, overwhelmingly Arab, and there are also some Christians, both Christian and Muslim Arabs, and 
Other people as well who are neither <laughs> Jewish nor Arab all live as citizens in the state of Israel. So that's one of the points you're making. It sounds to me, Ken, that you are comfortable with a, 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 an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians which does not require the Palestinians to say formally, unambiguously, that Israel is a Jewish state. Do I understand you correctly? Yes, I, I don't think it's a requirement. I think the important issue here is that going back to 1993, the Palestinians have recognized Israel as a sovereign state. That was the, the big concession. 1993, basically, the Palestinians said, our claim is now only 22% of historic land of Palestine. And what was the Palestinian mandate back then? So that if you look at it, that was the major concession, recognizing Israel. I think that we will want, as part of any peace agreement, an end of all claims, and that includes the right of return, and an end of the conflict. We don't need anyone else to define who Israel is. I have nothing against this, this notion of, of um, asking for this as part of the negotiations. Um, this has become, obviously, one of Prime Minister Netanyahu's leading points here. And I think he is, is correct in the sense that when you get to end of claims and end of conflict, you de need some acceptance on the other side of, of our narrative, of our understanding of our place. But I don't think we need a, a, a declaration for us to know who we are and why we're in Israel. How can anyone expect there to be peace between Israel and the Palestinians if the Palestinians are unwilling to acknowledge that Israel is a Jewish state? You know, I, for me, it's not about the symbolism of it. There is something very, very important, it seems to me, that if two sides are honest in a peace agreement, in a peace negotiations that will lead to peace between them, that both sides want to recognize the legitimacy and the legitimate status of each people's claim. And it seems to me that if the Palestinians begin with a notion that there is no Jewish state of Palestine, uh, a Jewish state of Israel, yes, you know, there's, there are two states, but one of them is the Arab state of Palestine, the Palestinian state of Palestine, but the second state is not the Jewish state of the Jewish people. I don't understand how one can expect there to be a reasonable sense of peace between the two if there is not this mutual recognition of the legitimacy of both groups. I think that the, the peace is going to be um, enforced, if you will, um, by, by a lot stronger mechanisms than a few words on the paper. I think that, and rightfully so, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu and other elements of the Israeli government have really been focused on, on security arrangements, and there's been a lot of movement there. Um, we don't know if the Palestinians are going to accept that. And here, I'm actually uh, very supportive of the Israeli government's focus on this and, and General Allen's um, work on behalf of uh, the Secretary of State. I think this is going to be enforced by security. Uh, and the second issue, which I think is fair, is, is what will be the thought process on the Palestinian side. This is why I think the issues of education and, and preparation of the Palestinian people for peace is much more important, again, than a, a few words of exactly how are you defining Israel. The Palestinians are well aware that Israel is going to be a majority Jewish state. And as I said, they've recognized Israel now for over 20 years. So I, I think we should be focused really on the one side, on the security and second on the education, and a little less on what you did say are symbolic words. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm trying again to understand, I, I want to find as much meaning and comfort in your perspective as I possibly can. And I know that in the Jewish world, there are really two perspectives, many more than two, but there are certainly two perspectives on the peace process, even among those like myself, who are very supportive. And I, I just hope, hope, hope that a two-state solution can be worked out between the Palestinians and the Israelis. At the same time, I understand that there are these two groups. One group says that the Palestinians really want peace. And, you know, who cares what the language is? And there's another group that says, we want peace too, and they also include those who don't want a two-state solution. But even among those like myself, who are committed to the notion of a two-state solution, it seems to me that the words are not simply words. And when you, when you say it, my rea I have a twofold reaction. You know, Ken's right. They're only words. What's the big deal? At the same time, I say, no, 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 no. 
words have enormous power and reflect mindset and reflect where the Palestinian people are and where the Palestinian leadership is. As you say, not only do Palestinians understand that Israel is a Jewish state, they also understand why it's important for the Jewish people to gain that kind of formal recognition from the Palestinians, and the Palestinians at the moment are not willing to give it. It would be so easy, it's such an easy thing for the Palestinians to do in an embrace of this peace process, to say, you know, we are moving towards mutual cooperation, living together and, and building bridges instead of fences. And so we understand why it's important for the Jews, for us to say, it's a Jewish state. And the ultimate reason, again, is it indicates the Palestinian recognition that Israel has an integrity of its own as a Jewish state, that it's not simply about Nablus or Hebron. It's also about Tel Aviv and Akko and Netanya, and that ultimately the Jewish people want a statement that, A, the Palestinians do not require an enormous right of return to their homeland, and that they understand that Israel has an integrity of a Jewish nature and their recognition of it is an embrace of a peace process which seems to me to be necessary. So for me, Ken, it's not simply, oh, it's words, and what do we care what people say? It's, it, we always argue it matters what people do. For me, the reluctance that they have to say it bespeaks an attitude which is then indicated and which is echoed by much of the resistance I see in the Palestinian community to embracing Jews and Israelis overall. And it's in that context I'd like you to address why, for you, the matter seems to be much less of a concern. Because I, I think there's so many other signs of progress in moving towards this normalization. You, know, you have Abbas, while I was just in Israel, Abbas welcoming to Ramallah, to his office, 300 young Israelis to talk about what peace could look like. While he was in South Africa, for Mandela's funeral, he spoke out against BDS. You know, so um, when I was in Israel now, we went with the Conference of Presidents to the new Palestinian uh, city, uh, Rawabi, which is being built outside Ramallah, where this is a, a billionaire Palestinian developer who's working with 600 Israeli companies to build his city. So the sense of normalizing relationships with Israel and, and understanding that BDS is not the answer, understanding, well, Abbas himself said that he has, he has no um, aspirations to move back to the spot where he, was, uh, where he was born. And again, that's not negotiating on right of return. That's a personal statement from the president of the Palestinian Authority. So there's lots of signs that the Israelis should be picking up on, that there's this desire from both the business community and the president of the Palestinian Authority to normalize and, and look for uh, ways to have this uh, peaceful relationship. And I know he's disappointing you and others on this one point, I would mention, by the way, that this issue of recognizing Israel as a Jewish state didn't even become prominent in all the negotiations until Netanyahu became prime minister. And I, and I accept that he has a right to ask for this, and he may indeed get it at the end of the negotiations, but to expect it as some sort of prerequisite to go forward I think is unrealistic when um, uh, there's other issues that are all open. And that's why I think the focus on security arrangements is actually the real issue that's going on, and this is a bit of talking point more than anything else. Bowie, I understand what you say, and you say it very, very well, but you didn't answer my question. Why wouldn't Abbas give this to Israel? It's, you know, the fact to me that it was never mentioned before is absolutely irrelevant. Very often we realize, all of us, realize in an argument that an important point was left out, and we add it. It doesn't bother me that now the Jews are making this point where they may not have made it earlier. But I want you to speak to why you believe something which seems to me, and, and if I'm wrong, explain it to me, it seems to me so benign. If Abbas is as committed as you describe, and I think it's very important what you mentioned to us, or there, are, there are legitimate signs which indicate a movement on the Palestinian side that should be encouraging and create a hopeful attitude for anyone who wants a two-state solution. At the same time, you don't explain to me yet why you believe Abbas and the, and the Arab League has such, a, has such an aversion to saying something which doesn't cost them anything except 
I believe it does, and that what it costs them, they don't want to give up, and if they don't want to give it up, it bespeaks something more powerful than all of the economic signs that you touch on. Well, I, I think there's something political going on here, too, and on both sides there are politics. Abbas knows that the minute that he would say a Jewish state, people would say, oh, you're giving up on the right of return. So you're giving up on an important negotiating point before we've even gotten in the room. So I'm, I'm saying that he may eventually accept certain language that adopts our Zionist narrative. And like I said, you keep saying Jewish state, and I keep saying homeland for the Jewish people. You see, you can have a place that you accept as the homeland for the Jewish people, and others are living there. But why not understand that he may want to give that up later in the negotiation when there's an agreement on maybe symbolic right of return, of unification of families? This is something that Olmer spoke about when he negotiated with Abbas the notion of, of symbolic right of return. So maybe that's the trade-off, Mark. But I think expecting it up front as a prerequisite at, at before the negotiations are done is, is actually unfair. You know, the enter to this, a, a, entrance to this discussions were all about, you know, there's, there's, there's no um, you know, prerequisites beginning the, the negotiations, and now we're saying, okay, but this is one he's got to declare now. All right, look, I don't think we're going to agree on this again. It's, <laughs> it, it's, no, it seems to me, Ken, that when you're negotiating with another party, the one thing the party, both parties, each party has a right to request, it's more of a request than a demand, it's almost an expectation, is that both sides recognize who they're dealing with and acknowledge publicly their integrity. So for me, it has to do with, uh, I believe it is political for Abbas, and I think the politics is expressed by the Arab League I don't feel the Arab League is nearly as, uh, what, uh, ready to accommodate as you feel Abbas is. But, okay, maybe you're right, and maybe we'll get there, and if everything else has worked out, the last thing Abbas will say is, and by the way, you're a Jew, <laughs> you're a Jew state. That's right. I, I do make a distinction in my own mind. We're not a homeland for the Jew. The Jewish state is the Jewish state for the Jewish people, and we have every right for the world, everyone in the world, to accept that. I want, I want to ask a different kind of question. Sure. I want to know about Hamas from your perspective, Ken. Right. Uh, it seems like Hamas remains committed to Israel's destruction. And at one point, the argument was that any peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians had to include all Palestinian territories, including Gaza, including Hamas. Now the peace agreement seems to be framed only in terms of the Palestinians on the West Bank. So I'm asking you, do you believe Hamas must agree to the terms of a peace settlement for there to be a serious, honest Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement? Or can it be made simply between Israel and Fatah and the Palestinian Authority and Abbas alone? So I think there's a, a couple issues. It's a very, very important question in my mind. First of all, um, Hamas has already given um, Abbas the power to negotiate on their behalf. They've said that the PLO... Palestinian Liberation Organization is the official negotiating um, party for the Palestinians, and Abbas is the chair of the PLO. So actually, Hamas is, has found a, a nice legal way to allow Abbas to negotiate on their behalf. So I think the first issue is uh, Hamas is aware of what's going on. They're watching it very carefully. And a, a lot of the, I would say, the pragmatics in Hamas are happy not to have to say yes or no about anything right now, but to see uh, how it goes. The second thing is about Gaza proper. There's an article in the Washington uh, Post today, actually, that um, quotes a December uh, internal poll that Hamas carried out that shows their popularity in Gaza down from 55% to 29%. So Hamas themselves understand that their inability to, to support their people in Gaza and their inability to provide economic opportunity is really costing them popularity. And I think in the end of the day, there, there is actually a, a, a serious possibility that if a peace agreement is reached and it is uh, confirmed uh, by Israel and is actually offered to the Palestinians, Hamas is going to be very hard-pressed uh, not to accept it. I think this is, is going to be a, a moving target here of who our enemies are. I think you're going to find Islamic Jihad, which is a much, much smaller group in Gaza, now becomes the anti-peace group. Mm -hmm. And so I actually think that one... It does have to include Gaza, ultimately. That's the answer to your first, your first question. And secondly, I think it's actually possible for Hamas to find itself 
as part of this formula. Again, not in a way that we would like. They're not all of a sudden going to embrace Israel and embrace Israelis, but I think that they're going to find themselves in a situation where they're going to have to accept a peace agreement if really it's put down and it's, it's, and it's offering the prosperity to the West Bank that Gaza wants as well. You know, when I, I love talking to you, and I, and I love you. And, and, you know, there have been many times when we've been in studio together, on the phone together, and you and I do not see eye to eye. But I have to say that the way in which you frame it and your optimism is, first of all, it's refreshing to me to hear it. I, I hope you're right. It, it does not reflect my, you know, my sense of who these people are and of what they do. And uh, my own sense is that Hamas has an element within it, a, an overwhelming element within it, which will do anything it needs to do to, in the end, prevent Israel and Palestinians in general from making peace. You seem to think that basically Hamas has seen the writing on the wall, their power has diminished, and that if they want to remain at all a factor in Palestinian life, they have to get on the, you know, the Palestinian peace process train, and then they'll worry about the Islamic Jihad. And by the way, we see a lot of rockets coming out of Gaza right now, which are exactly. not from Hamas, but from the uh, Islamic Jihad. So, I, again, it's not about whether we agree or not. I want people to hear someone articulate the perspective as beautifully as you do. I want to ask another question then. What about Israelis living on the West Bank? under a peace agreement. You know, uh, should Israelis living on the West Bank be permitted to remain if they are willing to live under Palesti Palestinian sovereignty? And the reason that's asked is, it seems like the Palestinian position is there, that in a peace agreement, every Israeli, every Jew has to leave the West Bank. And I keep wondering to myself, how can any liberal American, let alone a liberal American Jew, support any peace agreement as an honest and just agreement, if it includes a West Bank, which is Judenrein. So speak to me about how you view any claim that Jews have no right to remain, even under Palestinian sovereignty, on the West Bank. I think that um, in, in conversations with uh, Palestinian leaders, um, they, they've walked back from some of those, uh, what I think are extreme comments. And I think that there, there certainly could be uh, arrangements for Jews and should be arrangements for Jews who want to stay um, on the West Bank um, after a peace agreement. I think one of the um, issues is going to be actually more logistics than anything else. First of all, certain settlements, some of the isolated settlements, um, I'm sure people, not only people who want to stay there. And I, and I think it's more likely that Jews would want to stay um, perhaps uh, in, in closer to some of the cities. I, I, so I think that in, in a lot of ways it could work its way out, but I actually do agree with you uh, philosophically that Jews should be allowed to stay. Stay, of course, if there's certain uh, communities or settlements where they're living now which break up the contingu contiguous nature of the West Bank. So I don't think we can say blanket everyone should be able to stay wherever they are, because then I think you're going you're to not be able to build a real state. But I think finding arrangements for Jews who want to stay in the West Bank I think is, is, is definitely possible and, and even desirable as long as it gives the Palestinians the integrity of, and continuity of a real state. Okay, but so I, I, I have no argument with the point okay. you're making, which is that stating point blank that Jews shouldn't be allowed on the West Bank um, uh, in, in some way offends my um, you know, approach. I think that, yes, arrangements should be found for Jews to stay in the West Bank who want to. Okay, and my question was predicated on the notion that the Jews who stay, let's say, not in the ring around Jerusalem, but inside, deeper into the West Bank, if they're to stay, they're to stay under Palestinian sovereignty. Therefore, no Jewish community under Palestinian sovereignty would create a problem of, you know, enclaves of Jewish land inside Palestinian land, and there would be no contiguity. So that uh, I specifically want you to speak to the notion of Israelis living under Palestinian sovereignty. And just so you know, we are playing right now on Shalom TV a meeting I had with people in Karnei Shomron, which is a West Bank Jewish community. And I asked numerous people in Karnei Shomron the question, if there were a peace agreement, whether you like it or not, the peace agreement became reality, and you were given the option to remain in Karnei Shomron, but it would be under Palestinian sovereignty, would you want to stay or not? 
every single one said if there were an honest peace agreement and we were permitted to stay in Karnesh Amron, which is our home, it wouldn't matter to us whether it was Palestinian sovereignty or not. And those are the people I'm asking about. And, it, and it's a, an approach you don't normally hear Americans or American Jews see as an option. And I wanted to, to know whether you would argue that if there are Jews living on well, the West Bank and they were living to, willing to live under Palestinian sovereignty, there is no reason in the world why they should have to leave. Again, philosophically, I have no objection. I'd like to look at the practical uh, implications of what land they're on. Some of them were built on land that was originally Palestinian land. So it's a complicated issue, Mark. So I, I can't speak to Carnation wrong because I don't know the, the, the legality of the land issue, where the land came from. These are all issues that have to be looked at. There's a lot of, of rights issues here that I think we have to be sensitive to. Also, we're talking, don't forget, about this, uh, this issue of, of land and land swaps. I don't want to make things any more complicated than they have to. So philosophically, I have no problem. I think exceptions can be made, but I don't think the statement that was made by the prime minister, every settlement can stay where it is, is ne necessarily realistic. That's all. Look, Ken, you know, we've spoken about, about this many times. I've been a supporter of the two-state solution for as long as I can remember, not for the you know, current reasons, which I find to be both transient and somewhat disingenuous. I do not support the two-state solution for demographic reasons or because I worry about Israel's losing its democratic character. I support it because it's fair. There are two people in the land, both who feel it belongs to them. The only fair solution is to share the land, which is the position the Jewish people have taken since the 1930s when the British first published their white paper proposing partition. It's fair. But I don't see a Palestinian community that feels the same way, that feels it's, it's fair to them to share the land. I see a Palestinian community, and most important, a Palestinian leadership, which seems to believe Israel is still an illegitimate occupier on any land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. To the Palestinian people, the Jews have no more right to Haifa and Akko and Netanya and Tel Aviv than they do to land on the West Bank. And that's why, for me, Abbas and the Arab League do not want to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, because that recognition abrogates their claim on lands inside the Green Line. And that's why I see no real chance right now of peace coming out of the Kerry Initiative, and I don't see Israeli control of the West Bank ending any time in the near future, which means that Israel and American Jewry and world Jewry must find some other ways of dealing with the Palestinian people on the West Bank. You see it differently so I want you to take, you know, 30 seconds. What is it that you see again? Summarize it one more time why you believe that at the moment there is reason for optimism on the peace process. I think, first of all, that there's, a, there's an American um, game changer uh, in the sense that the Americans decided early in the president's administration to try to engage and see if there's an opportunity. That's number one. That's the positive point. On the other side, I think you have an Israeli government and an Israeli prime minister that is aware of the growing isolation of Israel in certain parts of the world, in certain uh, sections, in certain parts of the economy, and that this is actually a good time for Israel to try to get a good deal, a secure deal. So I think there's both the American facilitation and Israeli realization of, of what's going on in the world around it, and it brings us to a point where there's an opportunity. I'm not convinced market's going to happen. You should know that. Mm -hmm. I'm not a wild-eyed idealist. But I think the opportunity, the conditions are in, are in place right now to make an honest go of it. I'll say it again. You say it so well. And I'm always thrilled anytime I can offer you an opportunity to speak to our uh, Shalom TV audience. So I thank you very, very much, Ken. And we'll continue the conversation as the weeks and months progress. And thanks for the opportunity. I always enjoy it. Thank you, Ken. The thoughts of Ken Bob, president of the Progressive Labor Zionist Organization, Amenu. My thanks this in the news to Sloan Copeland, Serge Goldberg, Mark Baker. Until the next time, be well, my friends. <laughs>